Hi, I'm Jean Lee. And I'm Jeff White. Of The Lazarus Heist. And we're this week's guest on Metapod. You're listening to Metapod, where we unpack the web's most interesting podcasts and the stories behind them. Hosted by Wendy Morrill and Kevin May. Hello, it's Kev here. Welcome to Metapod. And this is Wendy. Thanks for tuning in to this episode featuring Gene Lee and Jeff White of The Lazarus Heist. Yep. The Lazarus Heist is a BBC World Service podcast examining cybercrime, specifically state-sponsored cybercrime in North Korea. The story starts in 2014 with a major hack into Sony Pictures, which effectively took hold of many of Sony's internal information systems and led to the leaking of confidential information about celebrities and employees into the public domain. Several other significant cyber attacks that North Korea is thought to have sponsored are also discussed, including the 2016 Bangladesh bank heist and the WannaCry ransomware attack that badly affected the UK's NHS, that's National Health Service, in 2017. Jean and Jeff are journalists with expertise in North Korea and cybercrime, respectively. Together, they tell a fascinating story of technology and international relations with plenty of historical and cultural context. Yeah, there's a lot to learn from the Lazarus heist about things that some of us may not be so familiar with, but what's great is that Gene and Jeff make things very accessible and connect the details and workings of a complex story to the experiences of ordinary people. It's a proper history lesson about both the region, the Korean peninsula in particular, and modern criminal methods. Very true. This is no measly bit of shoplifting, I think it would be safe to say. So, let's start the tape. Uh, Gene Lee and Jeff White, a very warm welcome to this episode of Metapod. We really appreciate you coming on the show and talking to us today. Thanks for having you. Great okay. to join you. Okay, so Lazarus Heist, terrific podcast. Um, I only just finished listening to the final episode a couple of days ago, so it's wonderfully fresh uh, for us to talk about today. But what I wanted to do first of all, and um, you can squabble amongst yourselves as to who takes each question. But what I'm kind of curious about is if there is such a thing as a hierarchy of heists, whether that's cyber or otherwise, <laughs> where would you say the Lazarus heist ranks? Oh, that's a really good question. A hierarchy of heists. Um, it's interesting. I think the ones that always get the attention, the ones that seem to get on the news are obviously the ones yeah. that happen in physical space. So we had, you know, in London, we had the Hatton Garden heist where, where jewels were stolen from a sort of underground bunker by a bunch of, uh, of, of elderly blokes. <laughs> and they just got blanket <laughs> coverage. It was astonishing because, yeah. you know, you've got a thing to point a camera at and you've got, uh, in this case, um, the Diamond Geezers, as they became known, uh, <laughs> who you can put on telly. Um, but, you know, in terms of money, I, I just think as a bank robber, why would you try and rob a bank physically? You have to go there. You probably get caught. You have to escape the country. You have to get the stuff in a van. You know, for me, the cyber stuff is the obvious way to go. It's certainly where you make more money. And potentially you can do it from a jurisdiction that's across the world where you stand little chance of law enforcement catching up with you. Not that I'm propounding, proposing that people do this, but <laughs> for me, it's, that's why cyber's become a bit of a, 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 an obvious goal, I think, for, for criminals. I don't know how you feel about it. What, what do you think about that, Gene? Well, I think it was definitely one of the most ambitious bank heist, if not perhaps the most ambitious, and didn't quite succeed. We're not giving anything away, uh, but um, but definitely one of the most ambitious, a billion dollars. And so it certainly ranks up there in terms of goals of how much money, you know, in terms of what the what the what the hackers were seeking to get uh, and what they were seeking to rob from them. Could you give a brief definition of cybercrime and maybe just sort of the parameters, like what sorts of activities are involved and what kinds of people or things are involved? It's interesting. A lot of law enforcement people will draw a distinction between cyber enabled crime and cyber crime. Okay. So they'll look at a sort of traditional type of crime and say, well, it's just a traditional type of crime, but, you know, it's the cyber bit that's enabling it. I think that distinction's kind of broken down. I don't hear people talking so much about that now, partly because certainly in the UK, cybercrime, in terms of number of offences, now massively outweighs 
all other types of crime. So if you add up the number of cybercrime offences, it, it adds up to far more than the other types of offences, certainly in the UK, and has done for a few years. Um, in terms of what is cybercrime, I mean, it's just it, it's such a massive area. You've got so all sorts of different bits, everything from, you know, text messages being sent to you that appear to come from the NHS, but don't, um, all the way through to, you know, this billion dollar bank heist attempt that we've covered through to things like ransomware, where thieves scramble your files and charge your ransom to, to, to unscramble them. In a way, the sort of boundaries of cybercrime are only as limited as the creativity of the hackers. And unfortunately, they turn out to be quite creative people. Are there particular motives involved there other are, than money? Well, yeah, I was going to say money being the key one, but it's interesting. Right. So for me, there are kind of three sort of hacker groups, hacker phenomena. Organized cybercrime is one of them. So basically, you've had organized gangs who've shifted online. They've realized, as I said, that you know you can rob a bank remotely, and you're far less likely to get caught, and you might also get more money. What's interesting is around the sides of that, you've also got the the nation state stuff. So you've got government hackers, and we employ them in the UK. They employ them in the US. Most countries employ government hackers. Um, what's interesting about those folks is it's a nine to five job, probably more hours than that. They clock in, they clock out. They're extremely well resourced. They are going after usually intelligence. Uh, material trying to get a strategic advantage over other governments you've also got a third group of people who are what i call hacktivist type people generally lower level of skill generally um has to be said there is this cliche about you know young lads in their bedroom doing it and that is it's a cliche partly because it's true a lot of the people convicted of this are tend to be young men interesting they're not interested in 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 money necessarily they're not interested in you know hacking for government secrets they're interested in hacking so they can prove that they can do it and, and actually so they can get bragging rights with other hackers no less dangerous because of it. I mean, some of the biggest and most impactful hacks, certainly for companies, have, been, have come from, frankly, 18-year-olds sitting in their bedrooms, you know, hacking, hacking remotely. What's interesting for me is those three groups have started to merge together. So what's interesting in the Lazarus heist and the, and the, the North Korean activity that's alleged around them is um, they are using cyber criminal tactics. All the stuff they do, all the tactics they use, the tools a lot of the time they use are cyber crime tools. But this is a nation state hacking team using those cyber crime tools to steal cash. That's why the, the Lazarus heist is really interesting and why the allegations against North Korea are really interesting, because it's these two groups coming together. And that's when right. it gets really dangerous. If you've got government hackers, you've got a lot of time and a lot of money using cyber criminals tools that are really advanced and really good, the results tend to be quite uh, dramatic. I wonder, actually, Jean, just from pers some perspective on this, from listening to the Lazarus heist, I wonder if the Sony hack at the beginning was motivated by anything other than revenge because I sensed because of the backstory with the interview the movie that was made and I didn't know whether it was implied or not but whether you thought that first one was a revenge heist or whether it was to Jeff's points grandstanding trying to make money or other things. So what's interesting about the Sony hack is that it did demonstrate this other purpose for cyber hack I believe which is to so discord or to sow chaos. And there's another side of cyber hacks that the North Koreans utilize, and that is to use it as a form of asymmetric warfare. You know, I, I also have to remind people that the United States is still uh, locked in a state of war, technically, with North Korea that stems from the Korean War of the 1950s. And so it's a bit of history. We call it the Forgotten War in the United States. The North Koreans have not forgotten it, uh, but they are obligated under the uh, truce that was signed in 1953 called the Armistice Agreement not to engage in, in flat out warfare, but I think cyber presents a really interesting opportunity for them. Certainly there was no cyber in 1953, so it's not explicitly laid out in the truce, uh, but it presents an opportunity for them to strike in a way very covertly, very quietly, very cheaply and very effectively. And so we have to look at it as a form of asymmetric warfare. And when it comes to Sony, I think there were multiple uh, motivations and purposes for planning out that attack. Perhaps it was revenge. I do think it was also to test their capability and to plant a flag and to show the United States what their capability would be if indeed it was North Korea. And also to show that they can take hold of our lives and turn it upside down. So it is that type of uh, sowing, discord and chaos. You know, in South Korea, we saw it all the time. They were targeting South Korea with those types of attacks for years before we in the United States became aware of it with Sony. 
One of the things that I certainly enjoyed about the podcast, and I think Kevin would agree with me, is the way you've woven in history of Korea into the story. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you approached the storytelling of of that piece of it, having in mind that an audience might not be familiar with that. I know I, I was not so familiar with it. Were there certain pitfalls that you tried to avoid or certain approach that you took to that? I do think that understanding the larger context of what's happening on the Korean Peninsula and in in North Korea is important to understanding the why. So I think Jeff is brilliant at explaining how they carried this out, especially because I am not a cyber expert. Uh, (laughs) But, you know, what I wanted to do was explain why, like, what will be motivating them? What what is the reason behind all of this? Uh, And for us to, to really take a step back And instead of just envisioning one person carrying this out on their own, for us to understand that it's part of a much bigger strategy and a much bigger picture that goes back decades or even hundreds of years. Uh, And so it just, I think that the goal with bringing history into it is to show that it's much bigger than one person operating, would you say lad? And (laughs) we don't don't use the word lad, but I love that. (laughs) A lad in a basement. Uh, but you know that it. But there's, you know, as Jeff mentioned, that it's a state-supported operation with much bigger implications. The, one of the pitfalls, of course, is that history can be. You have to find a way to make history engaging. Otherwise, your eyes just, yeah, you probably people will probably tune out when they're listening. So, I just, for me, I try to bring in my own personal family history because my family is Korean, and so I felt that there, there's one way to really get people's attention and that that's to personalize things. And mm-hmm. so by sharing some of how that history played out in my own family, and I was lucky because my late uncle uh, had written this memoir, has an, it was just published by the family, but I just mined it for some interesting details. And it was fascinating for me. And I hope that some of those details were fascinating and interesting for listeners and help them put into context how this might affect a person, somebody like me who is American yet has a family history in Korea. Right. Jean, I I couldn't help but wondering a lot of the time if you feel unsafe doing your work and if doing this podcast made you feel unsafe as well. Well, That's interesting. I think we had a lot of discussions about this at the BBC because, of course, the topic that we're discussing is very sensitive, not only in terms of cybersecurity, but we're talking about North Korea. And, but I've been living with this for quite a long time. And so all of the sensitivities and concerns around reporting on North Korea are um, concerns that I've been working with and working within for many years. And it doesn't mean that I, I think we always have to be vigilant. I was just telling my sister today, Jeff, I don't know if you received one of these notices from on Google Chrome about a potential uh, cyber attack from state-sponsored attackers. I think that a number of American journalists received this message, including me. Mm-hmm. And so it's been a little bit of Twitter discussion and chatter about it, but I've been receiving these for years. Mm-hmm. And so I mentioned to my sister uh, that these are things that were once privy or once the reality for a small group of us. And now it's just that so many more of us are mm-hmm. vulnerable but you take the same precautions now, I think, on an everyday basis for all of you, all of the listeners um, that I've had to take for many, many years. But absolutely, every time you deal with North Korea, you have to think about your safety. And that's certainly something we've thought about with this podcast as well. I will just tell you that my policy is that hey, we're not making anything up. We don't have an agenda. We are mm-hmm. just journalists trying, trying to shed light on what we believe is the truth. And I've always told the North Koreans that they have to, they have, it's not how they do things, but that they have to respect it. I must say, I was quite impressed, well, not quite impressed. I was very impressed that, you know, and you showed your kind of your journalistic chops by even though you, some would say you probably didn't even need to, but you did put responses mm. in from the North Korean government or various ministries mm. to the accus- accusations, which I think um, uh, lesser lesser professional journalists may not have done that. That's just a comment. That's not a question. But I was going to say, I mean, Jeff, you write about technology all the time. You must be pretty terrified to even open your phone 
<laughs> or start your laptop in the mornings. You probably know all the various <laughs> methods that people are trying to deploy, right? Um, well, depressingly, in the history of cybercrime, which probably goes back serious cybercrime, maybe 20, 25 years or so, yeah. um, the tactics are depressingly similar the whole way along. If you look at yeah. the vast majority of victims of cybercrime generally, but also the ones we covered in the Lazarus heist, it is frankly dodgy emails. The, the key way that computer hackers get into organizations is by sending a dodgy email to somebody who unwittingly opens it up, clicks on the uh, link or, or opens the attachment. Sometimes now through LinkedIn, you know, you get a job offer through LinkedIn or through Twitter, something gets sent to you. But fundamentally, that's the way in, you know, arguably 80% of the, the stuff that happens, the bad stuff that happens online is that and could be prevented by people, you know, not opening those dodgy emails. So in a way, that low-level stuff is quite easy to defend against. I suppose the difficult thing is that the sort of 20% of it that that is more targeted, that is more canny. Um, but, you know, like Gene, I've been covering this stuff for, for, for many years and have been kind of paranoid from the beginning, um, which is useful because, you know, you need to sort of set your security up right from the very beginning because otherwise hackers can kind of go back in time and, and go back to the bit where you weren't so careful with your, your emails and your security and so on. But, uh, but as Gene says, we had, you know, we had a lot of conversations about this because frankly, one of the stories we're covering, as you point out, is Sony, a massive media organization that was critical of North Korea and got hacked allegedly as a result. And the BBC is a massive media organization. We are putting something out that would be seen as being critical of North Korea. We don't want the next step to happen. So yeah, it was on our minds from, from, from the very beginning, I think. For the people listening in your backgrounds today, there is someone standing in the background that is um, that is Kim Jong Un, but its face is kind of darkened so that it looks like he's in the shadows to represent someone who like a hacker, I would imagine. Does that mean when you were pulling this together that it was actually quite difficult to get people want to talk to you because it is a profession that lurks in the shadows almost, or were people very open and you could see who they were and you could check their bona fides and those kind of things, because it is a, it is a dark art almost. Well, it's interesting. I mean, the people who've allegedly carried this out, the, the North Koreans who've now been charged by the US uh, in connection with these offences, obviously they are in North Korea. And, you know, good as we are, the, the, the idea that we'd actually be able to go and interview them and speak to them, I, I don't think it was ever... I don't know about Eugene. I don't think that was ever on the cards. I was just going to add that you know I I kind of see the image of the leader in the background almost as this figure who oversees this whole operation. So that's right. sort of how I see that that imagery, and I think that that was one of the goals that we had with the podcast as well is to link this back to the Kim family, which really is like a royal ruling family like a modern day monarchy, the image to me, and I know listeners won't be able to see it, but it's like a black silhouette of Kim Jong-un. Yep. It's just that he is the man who is benefiting from all of this, who is overseeing all of this. You draw a line straight back to him. So uh, go back to something that you said earlier, Jeff, when you said the stereotypical image of a hacker is this probably uh, a, a young male teenager early 20s probably doesn't see sunlight very often very pale does their thing in their bedroom but I wonder if what are there many uh, women hackers that are or is just the profile mostly men do you think um generally, it's not gen generally not specific to the North Korea story here it, it's starting to change um so when we're talking about hackers should just clarify it's a slightly ambiguous term the phrase hacker because it covers obviously people who are committing cyber crimes and doing it on behalf of governments, you know, like the people we've covered in the Lazarus heist. Um, but it also covers, you know, the ethical side of hacking, you know, computer people who are just trying to break security so they can then fix it and make it better. So there's, there's a, you know, it's, and there's a lot of grey area in between that. It has to be said There's some people who claim they're doing it for good purposes who aren't. Some people who claim they're doing it for bad purposes who turn out to be doing it for good purposes. There's a lot of grey murkiness in there. Um, certainly on the ethical hacking side, yeah, there's been a, there's been a, a, a big shift and there continues to be a big shift in terms of numbers of women coming into the industry. It, I have to say we are starting from a low base. It is still the case that if you go to a cybersecurity conference, it's one of the very few conferences where there tends to be a queue for the gents lose as opposed to the women's lose. Um, that is starting to change. In terms of the, 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 the illegal hacking, that's trickier to, to get a handle on because obviously those people don't necessarily want to be sort of surveyed. But if you look <laughs> at the Ministry of Justice statistics in the UK, it is still the case that 
the vast majority of people who get prosecuted for the Computer Misuse Act offences, which is our main law against hacking in the UK, vast majority are identified by the Ministry of Justice as male. So it's still the case mm -hmm. that certainly the ones that are being caught for the criminal hacking uh, seem to still be uh, skewing male. Although I should point out, actually, interesting, the police often won't prosecute people under the Computer Misuse Act offences and the hacking offences because they find it easier to prosecute people under the theft offences. So I think for the true picture, you might have to take into account theft. But yeah, it's still... It, let's be honest about this still a male dominated industry certainly for the moment just 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 on that point jeff why is it that they they prosecute them under an act that isn't perhaps totally relevant to the crime it's it's easy often you know what you're looking for is the proceeds of the crime what you end up with is somebody who's stolen right. some bitcoin or hacked or got a got a credit card details and used them so they've committed fraud they've committed theft I think, frankly, police officers find those easier to prosecute because they know what a theft looks like. Um, and also the Computer Misuse Act isn't a great piece of legislation. And sometimes the sentences that they get aren't, aren't particularly relevant. So that's, that's why they do. Going back to the, the Sony hack, is Hollywood out of touch with global politics, do you think? I mean, when I heard this part of the story, I felt like it was quite a big disservice to Americans. Um, so I'm just curious what you thought of that. I don't know how much time you all have spent in Hollywood, but it does. <laughs> I mean, California really should be its own country. <laughs> and it feels very far from, from Washington, D.C., sadly. I'm trying to get my way over there. Uh, but it is really interesting when you, when you land in California, you realize, oh, people out here really, they're, they're, their interests and their uh, priorities are just completely different. Uh, but that said, I do think that I felt a little bit of that when I heard the news, and, and this was, I, I did share some of this in the, in the podcast, but when I did hear the news that they were making a movie, the interview, I just knew that that was uh, going to be, in a sense, a, such an affront to North Korea and to the North Korean leadership to, to make a movie about the assassination of a living leader of a real country, which is mm. something... I, you know, as we discuss in the podcast, I, ha I couldn't think of a, a, another example of that. And to me, it made, it made me think that oh, so the, the executives at Sony Pictures just have no clue that this is a real country. It's not a fictional place. Hmm. It is not a, he is not a cartoon character, despite what you see behind me. Um, and that this, I, I suspected that it would, there would be some consequences. And I did often say, even back then, I just wish that they had given it a fake name. Mm. We all know what country it is, but it's not <laughs> that name with that person. Uh, in that sense, I do think that they were, it, they did tend to see North Korea as a fictional country. And I, I think that's the problem for a lot of us. We don't have much interaction with North Koreans or with North Korea. And it's often portrayed in a very cartoonish way. Mm. And uh, for me, it was very real. Um, I think that if they had consulted with some of us on the East Coast, uh, or, or policymakers in D.C., they may have had a different response. Uh, but, um, you know, that's... <laughs> I was going to say, this is really interesting debate. I find What I find really interesting is as soon as you think of doing it about the real Kim Jong-un, as soon as you have that idea, which was a sort of light bulb that I think went on over the head of Dan Sterling, the guy who wrote the script for the interview. As soon as you have that idea, if you then start saying, well, actually, no, let's not do it. What creeps into your thinking, I, I suspect, is this idea of, well, I'm toning this down. I'm toning it down because I don't want to upset Kim Jong-un. You get into this really interesting kind of set of thoughts that leads you to the point, well, no, no, I have to do it. Now I've thought of it, I have to do it because if I don't do it, I'm backing away. I'm backing away from, you know, effectively a, a bully is, is how you could describe it. It's not something we should do. So I, I, I followed the logic. I agree with Gene, but I did follow the logic of how you could end up thinking, no, we're going to do it because we kind of have to now because we've had the thought. I did have the impression listening to the writer speak about it in hindsight. I'm just surprised. Um, I, it wasn't clear if he thinks much differently about it now, if that makes sense. Um, it's, very, it's a very good question, actually, whether, whether Dan, given the opportunity, whether Dan Sterling would do it all over again. Um, part of me well, thinks he would, part of me thinks he wouldn't. <laughs> I suppose the question is, do you think anything has changed since then in Hollywood with entertainment production? You know, this is a really tricky question. I had a discussion about this yesterday about how Hollywood can sometimes be swayed by political and commercial 
concerns. And then it raises the question of free speech, which is something that we hold so dear in the United States in the West. Uh, and you know, certainly there are concerns that certain companies are tiptoeing around certain governments, China namely, uh, because, of, because of some commercial concerns that they have, not rather than political. Uh, you know, with this, this issue of free speech and not allowing a foreign government to dictate our creative choices, our editorial choices, is a really important one. I think with the last, with sorry, with the Sony hack, I do wish, however, because my I did feel my personal safety was at stake at the time. I that's a personal issue for me was that I wished I hadn't gone down that route. I think if you wanted to see the movie made and released theatrically, uh, they certainly hadn't wanted or anticipated that extra layer of security and danger that surrounded the release of the movie. Uh, so it's a really complicated issue. And I, do, I think it does raise questions about uh, where we stand up to free speech, but for our right to creative expression, when we think about the political and commercial implications. And it's not a clear cut answer, uh, but I just wish they hadn't gone down that route because the <laughs> movie certainly could have been effective without all of this, without putting so many people in peril and compelling and giving them the alleged attacker, attackers or the attackers the excuse to test out their capability and to put them on the road to developing this cyber capability that has just grown and become more terrifying in the years since. Going to lighten the the, uh, the the load just a moment and ask, put you both on the spot and ask you to tell me what you would give the film one out of ten. <laughs> I I actually thought it was better than I was expecting. Uh, what okay. out of ten? What would I give it? I'd probably I'd probably give it a six six yeah about a six maybe even going on a seven. But I know I think I think Gene feels a bit differently even from a creative standpoint, let alone the politics one. I give it a four. You know, I think it's hard for me because I obviously I know North Korea well. So if you've chosen to call it North Korea uh, to portray it as inaccurately as they did, it's hard. It's like you see the, a place that you know so well. Uh, there are some actors that I really like, but I think the portrayals were very cartoonish. And that is a little bit of what slapstick is about, but uh, and comedy is about. But I, I can't help but separate uh, what I know about the place. And, and some of it was just crude humor that I personally don't, didn't really like. Okay, well, just just for the record, um, IMDb, which is the Internet Movie Database, gave it a score of six and a half out of ten, so, which was slightly closer to Jeff than Eugene, I'm afraid, on this occasion. I'm a so. harsh critic, sorry about that, <laughs> but I'm a very harsh critic. <laughs> we shouldn't argue with the wisdom of the crowds or the <laughs> or the lack of wisdom, anyway. Um, right, so we'll get back to some serious questions now, if we can. I mean. Is it true that things like ransomware and cybersecurity, the protractors, the people that are designing this, are always one step ahead of those that are trying to defend themselves? Uh, no, that's definitely not true. Every now and again, okay. law, yeah, every now and again, law enforcement gets ahead, and and they. The problem is, law enforcement moves a lot slower than cybercrime does because cybercrime doesn't have to sort of clear everything with the government to get funding for it. They can just go for it. So obviously, cybercrime inevitably evolves at a quicker pace than law enforcement could ever evolve at. But what law enforcement's quite good at doing is sort of seeing where things are going and thinking, right, okay, if we just work for the next six months or a year and we work towards that bit, we'll be able to take down that part of it. So every now and again, you do get these great, you know, law enforcement efforts where. Suddenly, out of the blue, they shut down, you know, 200 servers and they completely ruin that particular cyber criminals party. Um, and, it's, you know, it's a wonderful moment. And occasionally they bust down doors and make arrests. So, you know, it, it does happen. I don't want people to be depressed and think, oh, the, the, the police will never catch up. They do. It's just it takes them a while to catch up. They have a success and then the cyber criminals will race ahead again. So it's, it's a cat and mouse game, to use the cliche. And just one last kind of myth busting question, then, is is it often true that many, many hackers or cyber criminals often just get employed by governments because they're quite handy? Uh, yes and no. It depends whether you've been caught <laughs> for a start. <laughs> well, yeah. if, you've, if you've been caught and convicted, it will affect your ability to get a security clearance uh, yes. and to pass. So certain government work, for example, certainly bank work, you would struggle, I think, to get work with a cybersecurity company if you've had a conviction. I think I've come across instances where it's happened. It's very rare. Um, but of course, if you're a hacker who has sort of escaped 
the law, <laughs> frankly, and done something wrong but not got caught for it, you might be able to, to do that. However, the cautionary tale, of course, is our chap Marcus Hutchins, who appears in episode 10 of The Lazarus Heist, who, frankly, had got away with his crime for quite a number of years uh, and then suddenly was in the limelight and uh, it all caught up with him and he was, did actually, he was actually convicted uh, for that crime. So uh, it's just because he hasn't been caught now doesn't mean you're gonna get, not going to get caught eventually. On the global stage for cybercrime, are there countries that are in a similar trajectory that I think you've portrayed for North Korea here, or countries that are in a on a completely different track of cyber criminality? What's interesting in that is how you sort of define cybercrime. So one of the examples I've used in the book I wrote last year was was the example of GCHQ, our own intelligence agency here in the UK, God love them, um, who frankly hacked into, according to documents released by Edward Snowden, hacked into a Belgian uh, SIM card manufacturer, a mobile phone SIM card manufacturer, uh, and actually hacked the employees' accounts in order to get access to that company, in order to access the SIM cards, in order then to access uh, probably terrorist, terrorist networks, I'd imagine, or criminal networks. Um, now, you know, the, the end is good, you know, the end result is, is trying to sort of crack down on crime, but the means by which you do it, as in hacking the individual accounts, apparently, of, of, of individuals, that to me seems Frankly, that's that looks a lot like cybercrime to me. I'm sure they had sign off from the UK government. They work under all of these rules. But so this is really grey area as to, you know, what is uh, what is cybercrime and, and who's doing it and what our rules are. And those rules in cyberspace are very, very undeveloped. You know, you don't have the rules of engagement, the rules of war that you do in a, in a, a sort of hot conflict, a physical conflict. Um, so in terms of, sort of who's doing what and where it sits in the sort of cybercrime spectrum uh, i think there's a lot of debate to be had about that i mean certainly in terms of the uk i think most of the people you'd ask would you know would rank the threats in terms of you know china russia iran north korea you know with some sort of movement between those between those four so that's sort of where the uk sits i think in terms of the strategic threats it sees and iran is a really interesting example again it's a small country not necessarily massively well resourced but you know in, in cyber terms you know, has been accused of some some really quite striking uh, striking cyber attacks. So, yeah. So you wouldn't say there are particular cultural or political elements that add up to the ideal cyber crime state. <laughs> I always see what you mean. Interesting. <laughs> like a, um, a checklist, maybe. A checklist. Well, actually, interesting. One of the one of the things I did find fascinating when I was researching Russia and cyber crime was. Um, there was a there was a, a really interesting sort of picture got painted, which was the number of people doing technical degrees and technology and science and maths degrees uh, in Russia. Huge culture in Russia of of science and technology and maths um, education, something they value very very highly. As actually does uh, I believe North Korea. Um, and so it's an interesting picture of lots and lots of very bright tech grads coming out during the nineties, uh, and obviously the point when the Soviet Union had collapsed and, and Russia was really really struggling. There was a proportion of those people who then went on to cybercrime. So I guess culturally, you could say, well, look, if you're if you're a culture that really supports technology, supports maths, and so on, um, you might end up with a lot of hackers in that in that society. I suppose that's as, that's as far as I'd go on that thought. I guess. <laughs> I would just add to to that that uh, if you've got a country that is particularly desperate to make money and is limited in its in its ability to make money like North Korea because of the sanctions that have been imposed on North Korea uh, as punishment for its nuclear activity as a way to constrain their ability to make money to build nuclear weapons that certainly gives them plenty of incentive and motivation to look for other ways to make money mm-hmm. and as we explained that's part of the motivation for turning to cyber. It's a great investment for them and one that they're very desperate to take advantage of. Uh, interesting, Gene, on that point. I mean, is cyber criminal activity uh, as portrayed in the Lazarus heist, where does that stand in if there is a rank of ways that North Korea makes money or has the ability to get money to pursue either economic activity or some of its uh, less desirable things such as making missiles and stuff like that. And it's really hard, I'm not sure. Uh, So one thing I should mention is that we have so little hard data from North Korea. They have not revealed their economic data for decades. Uh, We make estimates based on, for example, trade. There's their import and export 
statistics that China has, for example. So we kind of, we have some numbers, but we certainly don't know the full scope of what their economic activity is. So it's hard to say, A, how much of their money comes from cyber and B, it's just hard to really track the money that they're making from cyber. It's so hard with the attribution and the sourcing to really trace and track. And that's why it's so brilliant. It's so hard to really nail down who's behind these cyber crimes and the cyber theft, which makes it uh, such an attractive form of theft yeah. for these bad actors. The United Nations has obviously been tracking a lot of this stuff and does mm. you know, a lot of work on, on sanctions, um, sanctions busting and sanctions dodging and that kind of thing. And so they, uh, they've totted up, I think, various of the um, cyber crimes. And a lot of this is around cryptocurrency and things like Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency exchanges. Um, and I think there was a figure of 1.3 billion uh in there 1.3 billion dollars which is obviously a huge amount of money what's interesting though is if you look at the united nations reports and where they're getting this information from there's a sort of list of you know well we get some of it from governments okay we get some of it from financial institutions okay some of these figures come from the victim organizations themselves the cryptocurrency exchanges okay and some of it comes from media reporting at which point i'm thinking well hang on <laughs> do i <laughs> You're trusting. I am a journalist. Don't get me wrong. I hope that people trust what I put out. But but you would have thought the United Nations would, would want a level of proof beyond that. So as Jean says, it's really difficult to kind of attribute, even for the United Nations, to sort of get a solid handle on on you know how many of these attacks can actually be attributed uh, to North Korea. This is a small country. It's a very poor country, and a uh, country with a crumbling economy so many restrictions on how they can make money. And so anything that they're going to get from cyber is going to be valuable. Now, where that money goes is another question. Yeah. Um, now, you're going to have to forgive me if I don't get my terminology or the explanation right here, because every time I try and talk about <laughs> blockchain and things like that, I get very confused. So again, up front, forgive me. But cryptocurrency we, that's one side of things because that's a form of currency, it's a form of payment, and that's one of the elements of the story involved that. But from my understanding, technology such as blockchain is sp supposed to help either individuals or organizations trade information using distributed ledgers and things like that, sh which should, in theory, make hacking slightly more difficult. Is that correct, or is that are there are more nuanced? is to it than my i dare say uh, simply an explanation yeah it's interesting how blockchain will influence hacking i mean basically the term blockchain what this means is you take a piece of information so let's take a book take a book you can turn a book into what's called a hash which is a short string of letters and numbers so just you know say 30 letters and numbers put together you can reduce that entire book down to just that string of letters and numbers using a computer algorithm that book is then, if you like, trapped in amber inside that let series of letters and numbers. And that series of letters and numbers is what you upload to the blockchain. And everybody can have a copy of the blockchain. You can, I can, this person over here, you can put one on the moon and, and it can never, ever be changed. Once it's lodged in there, it can never be changed. Because each time you add something to that blockchain, you add another book, you add another contract, you add another you know, piece of information, it locks the previous ones down. So what you end up with is this growing sort of immutable store of information that everybody can access and that no if you try and change the contents of the book everybody's going to know because they can look back at the original hash and think hang on no the, the hash doesn't match anymore you've done it you've pulled a fast one so the blockchain is useful for information because it locks information down and it creates as i say this permanent uh, immutable store of information that everybody can access you know the, the record of the information so that's how sort of blockchain uh, feeds into it sadly i don't think blockchain brings hacking to an end <laughs> um it's it's good for lots of other reasons but uh, but if you ha you're hanging on blockchain to, to solve the hacking problem it's not going to happen i'm afraid the evolution of methods jeff um do any of them become more or less profitable over time i, I think there's a point in the story where you explain how one ransomware attack only results in $160,000. Yeah, I mean, criminal trends, cybercrime trends do come and go. So one thing that made a huge amount of money for people, you know, 20, 25 years ago was, was pirating software. So you could get computer software, you yeah. could pirate it, you could sell pirated copies. And that made huge amounts of money for people. Um, and then the companies got wise to it and they implemented sort of fixes for it so that you can only install it if it's a proper piece of software. So things come and go. Credit card fraud, again, used to be much, it still exists. A lot of credit card fraud exists, but it used to be much, much easier to do. We now have the sort of three digit number on the back and so on. Um, so, you know, the, these cybercrime trends do sort of ebb and, and, and flow. Um, the problem with the ransomware one, which is the one we talked about in the 
podcast is the ransoms that the hackers have been quite interesting about how they've set the ransoms. If you set a ransom of five thousand pounds, no one's ever going to pay it because it's like, well, I don't have that kind of money. You know, my laptop's only worth you know three hundred quid. So they set the ransoms at a sort of level that they think people will pay. And actually, it's an interesting movement now where the hackers will try and do some research on who they're hitting and charge them an appropriate ransom. So one thing they'll do in companies is they'll look for the insurance certificates that the company has. And if the, ins- the company's insured up to a million dollars for ransomware, the hackers will charge them a million dollars ransom because they say, well, you, we know you're going to get it back from your insurer. That's the amount we're charging. Whereas for you and I, they might say, well, we'll charge you sort of 50 pounds for, for the decryption key. Um, so that it's, it's interesting. And what this does is it keeps ransomware sort of bubbling along to the point where it's the point where it never really gets properly tackled because frankly if you know if, if i pay 50 pounds for ransom am i going to report that to the police would i report that to the police and if the police don't find out about it it doesn't hit the police figures and if it doesn't hit the police figures the police can't go to you know the home office and say we need budget we need millions of pounds to tackle ransomware because the home office will say well apparently it's not a problem because nobody's reporting it so ransomware is an interesting one it sort of bubbles along under the surface i, I don't know how ransomware comes to an end or how it how we get rid of this it just seems to be with us in an awful way and i don't quite know what the solution uh, solution is to it in terms of just not giving people ideas here about how much to yeah <laughs> no <laughs> do not do not pay do not pay the ransom is the, is the key thing you, in, you might not get your information back it's true in terms of the hardware involved um i mean you often hear about people's computers at home i mean what what else is there or might be coming? I mean, is my toaster going to do something or, you know, people's homes are quite connected now. Mine isn't, but um, what's next in terms of objects and hardware? Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about this, this internet of things, which is your, you know, your connected toaster, your connected fridge and so on. And I have to say, Initially, I sort of thought, well, this, is, this seems a bit of a hyperbole. It seems a bit of kind of, you know, talking up the fears and, and a lot of people talking up that, that, that problem was security companies who obviously make a lot of money out of fixing those problems. So they've got a vested interest in this all being afraid. However, there was a, a little while ago, there was a, a computer attack called the Mirai Worm, uh, which was a virus which spread around internet routers and webcams and odd stuff like that, a bit of, bit of security camera type stuff, it would infect them and then it would sort of har- harness them into this kind of computer um, hacking network. Um, so that basically, that Mirai worm, which spread like wildfire across the internet, called, caused all sorts of problems, um, and which bizarrely was related to an, an argument over Minecraft, of all things. That was actually targeting these Internet of Things devices. And the way, the way it was able to do it, the reason it was able to do that was because the passwords were rubbish, because they set a password when it leaves the factory. It's I don't know, one, two, three, four, whatever. And, mm. and then you install your webcam at home or your smart fridge or your smart toaster and you think, well, I'll just stick it in. It's connected to the internet, but the password is crap. So in a way, the threat isn't so much about you and your toaster and your fridge going wrong. The threat is if you install your toaster and your fridge and you plug it into the internet, someone could then hack into it and use your toaster and fridge amazingly, this might actually happen, to sort of stage an attack against somebody else. So you end up being sort of, your fridge ends up becoming part of a sort of hacker army. Um, it's it's a bizarre world, I, say, I know, but it does it has actually happened. I'm never going to turn anything on again. <laughs> I was just going to point out that that word, Mirai, uh, comes from, if I, if I have it right, comes from the Chinese characters. In Korean, the same word would be mide, which is future, which is a oh. huge code word in North Korea associated oh, really? with Kim Jong-un. Uh, so, and the Internet of Things really is kind of the, the attack of the future. South Korea is a place where, I don't know if, if you've, any of you have been there, uh, but it is paper connected, hyper high tech in ways that our countries are not. Mm. And so you can kind of see when you go there, you know, I always tell, I was, Jeff, in one of our conversations, I think I was talking about how when I first, and this was in, when I first moved to Seoul, you know, my family's there, so I go there all the time. But when I moved into my new apartment in 2008, I think they gave me 10 different remote controls to control everything <laughs> in my apartment. It was just uh, you know, overwhelming, but it did make me think, oh my gosh, there could be, I could just get taken down and locked in my apartment and unable to do absolutely anything, <laughs> even operate the toilet. Uh, <laughs> so this is the future. So, you know, you when you spend time in Asia, particularly South yeah. Korea and Japan, they are postmodern. They are ahead of the curve when it comes to this thing, but it, it, these things. But I think it makes them vulnerable as well. Mm. So I'm going to look into that um, that worm that you mentioned. But I suspect if you look at the etymology of that word, it is wow, the word for future. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs>
I wonder if um, if there is perhaps a kind of a sliding scale of people caring when it comes to cybercrime. So, for example, the Bangladesh one affected lots of people who was in a very poor country, and then people perhaps would care a lot more than the one against Sony, which you know, in some respects just showed how many producers didn't like actors and there was all the kind of salacious gossip. And I just wonder, well, when do people start worrying about it because it actually affects them? Is that is that the kind of the criteria rather than it's, oh, it's just a big company or it's just a big bank? I mean, not a lot of love lost sometimes when banks kind of lose money, yeah. right? Personally, I've had this. I've had this the whole time. You know, when you know, why should we care about cybercrime? Oh, you know, who dies? Nobody dies. You know, it's like, and I just think, I just it annoys me. The bar keeps getting raised. It's like, oh well, you know, I might care about cybercrime if hospitals get affected and you know, people have to, you know, well, yeah, that happened. I might be bothered if you know, if it affects the petrol supply. Well, yeah, it happened. Colonial pipeline. I might be bothered if you know, if if they could somehow swing an election. Yeah, it happened. Twenty sixteen. At what stage do we sort of go? Look, all of the worst <laughs> things that you think are going to happen as a result of, hack- of hacking have happened, and we do actually need to take this seriously. And like I say, it's more than half the crime in the UK at the moment. So I, I always feel it slightly unfair of people to turn around and say, oh, why should we care about? cybercrime because it's like well if i haven't given you enough examples in the past 30 seconds <laughs> then, you know you're clearly not that bothered about anything are you <laughs> so that's my that's me getting on my hobby horse but that's what i think i do think that one of our goals was to share the stories of real people who are like you and me who've been affected whose lives have been turned upside down by a tab so that it brings it down to a level an everyday level because I do think it is probably hard for people to relate to the, the average BBC listener to relate to somebody in Bangladesh whose life savings mm. yeah. may have been wiped out. But certainly there are some colorful characters targeted in the Sony hack who could be like one of my friends. And the compelling case of the WannaCry attack bringing down the, the, the image of you know somebody sit, lying on an operating table waiting for surgery and then the blanks just... Oh, the monitors just go blank because of a cyber attack. I mean, I think that these are things that bring it down to an everyday level and do drive home the point that this is something that can affect all of us. Uh, so I hope that what one of the things we've done is to really shed some light on how this affects all of us and not just people in a country far, far away. Um, speaking of everyday items, um, and I think this is getting towards the end of the series where you mentioned something about ATMs coming up soon. And I was curious if COVID-19 and the move to more cashless payments has changed anything about cybercrime. And this is probably a whole other conversation, but any comment mm-hmm. on that? Yeah, well, to, 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 to throw ahead slightly, the, 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 the Lazarus Heist story doesn't stop at episode 10 and at Wanna Cry. Um, it keeps going and Great. arguably keep, keeps getting even crazier uh, <laughs> and even more astonishing, um, particularly in terms of the sort of international networks of people that the, the, the North Korean hackers are accused of sort of working with and alleged to have, have, have worked with. Um, but I mean, to go to Gene's point, you, you know, the cash that you know the move towards cashless as a result of coronavirus has been has been really interesting beyond that we've all been pushed online we are doing this interview now online uh, we, you know the, the bulk of our interactions during those lockdown periods were online um to go to gene's point about the extent to which you know countries in asia rely on technology and are therefore vulnerable well, well that's that's all of us in the future you know increasingly carrying out all of our interactions monetary social whatever online so it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult message, really, to absorb because on the one, because it's basically what you're saying is the more we go online, the more we're at risk. But that is unfortunately the case. That's the sort of the joy of being online is we can do things like this and we can all get together remotely. That that the payment we have to make is unfortunately being being a bit bit better about our security, I suppose. The joy of so, being online is seeing Jean's dog. <laughs> it's the cutest Sorry. dog. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll post a pic. We'll take a pic of grab and we'll post a picture for this, so they know how. <laughs> really cute your dog is so uh, final question in (laughs) (laughs) is it a dance (laughs) (laughs) sorry about that Okay, right. I'm going to compose myself now right so uh, we're going to give you the final word Jean and uh, um, I don't think I've ever spoken to somebody who's uh, lived in North Korea and you know I think you're one of very few Westerners who's had that opportunity. 
uh, if opportunity is the right word, and you have Korean heritage. I just wondered, and we're kind of getting off topic from the, the hacking side of things, but what is your kind of sense of the kind of the evolution of the North Korean story from here on? I mean, what, what is it? Is anything going to change the status quo or or is this are we kind of stuck with this particular setup that we have now? That's a big question. I would like to think that the North Korean leadership, including Kim Jong-un, primarily Kim Jong-un, since he dictates which direction the country will go, that he does want a different future for his people. And it's interesting when we were when I was really looking at science and technology. So it's there during this period when he was being groomed to become the next leader. And as they were building up the propaganda around him, so much emphasis on science and technology. And I did see it as something that had so much potential to bring North Korea into the modern world, connect them with the rest of the world, but also had the potential to be used for nefarious purposes. And I've always been intrigued by how North Korea would use all of this education and interest in science and technology. But I do harbor the hope that if he does make a series of wise decisions about engaging with the outside world, about negotiating with the United States in particular about its nuclear program, that we can see them start to use science and technology for positive good for the people. Uh, the problem is, of course, is what we've seen is that the people have been held hostage by his decision to focus on building nuclear weapons and to use science and technology to raise the funds to build those nuclear weapons. I really hope for my family's sake, for the sake of the 50 million people in South Korea and <laughs> the 25 million people in North Korea, we don't continue on this track. And it's not just the Koreans, but the broader the region and the rest of the world that would whose security would be at risk if they continue on this path. Okay. And to finish on a lighter note, we will post a link to a video of the CNC song, which was the song that the North Korea came up with when it was doing some of the things around technology that you were discussing and it's referenced in, in the podcast. So uh, Jean Lee and Jeff White, thank you so much for spending your time with us this evening on Metapod. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Jean and Jeff for making time for us. We learned a lot and really appreciated their willingness to explain some basics about cybercrime and North Korea. Yeah, we really appreciate their professionalism. They were terrific guests, actually. We should also give a special shout out to Esther and John at the BBC for connecting us with Jean and Jeff. Thank you both. It's an excellent podcast, as most are from the BBC World Service, to be fair. And we hope that more episodes are coming soon. I must say, Wendy, I found the backstory into the history of North Korea probably as fascinating as the details about the Lazarus High cybercrime as well, really. So yeah. really, well, well done. Yeah, it's really well done. Um, as always, we've put links in the show notes if you're interested to read more about some of the topics related to the Lazarus heist. If you liked this episode, we'd love to hear that from you, and we always appreciate a rating or review wherever you listen. We do. Okay, we're also interested to know what you'd like to hear about on Metapod in the new year. Drop us a note on social media or go to the Contact Us page on metapodshow.com. 2021 has been a good year. Many Metapod guests have won or been nominated for awards, including Josh Baker of I'm Not a Monster, Nina Gildan CV of My Fugitive, Danny Robbins of The Battersea Poltergeist, Laura Palmer of Island Crime, Where Is Lisa, and others. So congratulations to them. Yes, they're all very well deserved, and we hope that you enjoyed their conversations with us too. Right, that's all for now, Wendy, and we'll see you all next time. We will. That's it for Metapod this time. Thanks for listening. Metapod will be back soon with another unpacking of the web's most interesting podcasts. But in the meantime, make sure to subscribe at any of the usual places you find your other favourite podcasts. We'd hate for you to miss upcoming episodes, and we'd love it if you left us a review. You can let us know what you think of this episode by going to metapodshow.com. We'll see you next time. Metapod is produced by Wendy Morrill and Kevin May.